Good morning. Welcome to the 129th Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. The Landon Lectures were begun in 1966 by the late Governor Alf Landon and the late K-State President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent public figures to Kansas State University to discuss the most important issues of the day. We are very pleased today to welcome Ashley Banfield to the Landon Podium to join 128 predecessors in bringing their thoughts and opinions on important public issues. Before introducing Ashley Banfield, I'd like to introduce the other members of the platform party. On my left, Dr. Al Cochran, professor of music and president of our great faculty senate. Next to him, John O'Hara, a senior in finance, accounting, and leadership studies, and our excellent student body president. John? <laughs> On my right, Edward Seaton, chairman of the Landon Patrons, editor-in-chief and publisher of our Manhattan Mercury. <laughs> Next to him, Dr. Charles Reagan, my executive assistant and the person that does such a great job year in and year out is chairman of the Landon Lecture Series. Chuck? Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this morning. I'm very pleased to introduce Ashley Banfield, who serves as NBC news anchor and correspondent. I'm sure many of you, certainly I do, I remember Ashley's brilliant work covering the terrorist attacks of September 11th, reporting live from the World Trade Center. For almost a year, between September 2001 and July of 2002, she reported live, real time, with first-rate reporting from Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Great Britain, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, in a prime time series called, What Else? A Region in Conflict. Many of us remember her lively and superb program here in Manhattan when as part of her MSNBC series called Ashley Banfield On Location, she had a full hour program on K-State's contribution to fighting agro-terrorism, talking about our food safety and security program and to assure the safety of America's food supply. As you might remember, in addition, she expertly covered the 2000 presidential election on the road with the Bush-Cheney campaign and the 2000 Summer Olympics. Ashley Banfield received her bachelor's degree in political studies in French from Queen's University in Ontario and began her journalism career in Canada. Actually, you're from Winnipeg. And I'm from Minot, North Dakota, so we have a lot in common. <laughs> Only 125 miles away. Well, later, she worked for a Fox station in Dallas where she received an Emmy for Best News Anchor for her coverage on the Cadet Killers and a Texas Associated Press Award for Best Series Category on the controversial To Serve and Survive. Now, you might or might not know this, but many of the Landon lectures that we get here, we're picking up either in New York or Washington. And Chuck and our other pilot fly nonstop from Manhattan to Washington, D.C. And so we're picking up Ashley in Washington, D.C. in the afternoon yesterday. Well, as you remember, we had some weather here, 100 miles wide. Now, we love that rain, though, didn't we? But we couldn't fly right back here into Manhattan. So they had to land in Kansas City and drive. Well, anyway, in driving back outside of Lawrence on I-70, Chuck and Ashley came upon an overturned car. And Ashley just said, look, we've got to stop. I've been trained in field medicine by the United States Army. She had to do that before going to Afghanistan. And so they stopped, and Ashley went over and intended to this lady that had been in an overturned car. That's just another example of her caring <laughs> attitude, isn't it? So that's, that's truly exceptional. Well, it gives me a great privilege to 
Welcome to the Landon Podium, a rising star for NBC and American television, Ashley Banfield, to join with 128 of her predecessors in giving her thoughts and opinions on the most important events of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Ashley Banfield. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. That was a, a very kind introduction. I would love to say that I'm a hero and was able to save this woman, but she was fine. I just gave her a quick check over and she was just, just fine. But it was quite an adventure nonetheless, and uh, Chuck and I have a story to tell for the rest of time. But uh, thank you so much, by the way, for inviting me to be here. This is a real treat and a real honor. Uh, the last time I was in Manhattan, Kansas, there were a lot of other stories that were uh, making top headlines, uh, not the least of which was the uh, anniversary of 9-11, the continued hunt for Osama bin Laden, uh, the whereabouts of Elizabeth Smart, and what was to become of Saddam Hussein. And we have some resolution on very few of these stories, um, but we certainly know at least what Saddam Hussein is not up to these days, and it's leading Iraq. So I suppose you all watch enough television to know that the big TV show is over, and that the war is now over, essentially. The major combat operations are over, anyway, according to the Pentagon and defense officials. But there is so much that is left behind. Um, and I'm not just talking about the most important things, which is, of course, the leadership of a Middle Eastern country uh, that could possibly become an enormous foothold for American foreign interests, but also um, what Americans find themselves deciding upon when it comes to news and when it comes to coverage, and when it comes to war, and when it comes to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate any longer. I think we all were very excited about the beginnings of this conflict in terms of what we could see for the first time on television. The embedded process, which I'll get into a little bit more in a few moments, was something that we've never experienced before, neither as reporters nor as viewers. Um, the kinds of pictures that we were able to see from the front lines in real time, on a video phone, and sometimes by a real satellite link up uh, was something we'd never seen before and were witness to for the first time. And there are all sorts of good things that come from that, and there are all sorts of terrible things that come from that. The good things are the obvious. This is one more perspective that we all got when it comes to warfare, how it's fought, and how tough these soldiers are, what the conditions are like, and what it really looks like when they're firing those M16s rapidly across a river or across a bridge or into a building. There were a lot of journalists who were skeptical of this embedding process before we all embarked on this kind of news coverage before this campaign. Um, many thought that this was just another element of propaganda from the American government. I suppose you could look at it that way. It certainly did show the American side of things because that's where we were shooting from. But it also showed what can go wrong. It also gave journalists, including Al Jazeera journalists and Arab television journalists and Arab newspaper journalists who were also embedded, it also gave them the opportunity to see without any kinds of censorship how these fights were being fought, how these soldiers were behaving, what the civil affairs soldiers were doing, and what the humanitarian assistance really looked like. Was it just a line we were being fed or were they really on the ground with boxes of water and boxes of food? Uh, so for that element alone, it was a wonderful new arm of access that journalists got to warfare. Perhaps not that new because we all knew what it looked like at Vietnam and what a disaster that was for, uh, for the government. But this did put us in a very, very close uh, line of sight to the unfolding disasters. <clears throat> that said, what didn't you see? You didn't see where those bullets landed. You didn't see what happened when the mortar landed. A puff of smoke is not what a mortar looks like when it explodes, believe me. There are horrors that were completely left out of this war. So was this journalism or was this coverage? There is a grand difference between journalism and coverage. And getting access does not mean you're getting the story. It just means you're getting one more arm or leg of the story. And that's what we got. And it was a glorious, wonderful picture that had a lot of people watching and a lot of advertisers excited about cable news. But it wasn't journalism, because I'm not so sure that we in America are hesitant 
to do this again, to fight another war. Because it looked like a glorious and courageous and so successful, terrific endeavor. And we got rid of a horrible leader. We got rid of a dictator. We got rid of a monster. But we didn't see what it took to do that. I can't tell you how bad the civilian casualties were. I saw a couple of pictures. I saw French television pictures. I saw a few things here and there. But to truly understand what war is all about, you've got to be on both sides. You've got to be a unilateral, someone who's able to cover from outside of both front lines, which, by the way, is the most dangerous way to cover a war, which is the way most of us covered Afghanistan. There were no front lines. They were all over the place. They were caves. They were mountains. They were Kabul. They were everything. But we really don't know from this latest adventure from the American military what this thing looked like and why perhaps we should never do it again. The other thing is that so many voices were silenced in this war. I mean, we all know what happened to Susan Sarandon for speaking out and her husband. And we all know that this is not the way Americans truly want to be. Free speech is a wonderful thing. It's what we fight for. But the minute it's unpalatable, we fight against it for some reason. That just seems to be a trend of late. And I am worried that it may be a reflection of what the news was and how the news coverage was coming across. This was a success. It was a charge. It took only three weeks. We did wonderful things, and we freed the Iraqi people, many of them, by the way, who are quite thankless about this. There's got to be a reason for that. And the reason for it is because we don't have a very good image right now overseas. And a lot of Americans aren't quite sure why, given the fact that we sacrificed over 100 soldiers to give them freedom. Well, the message before we went in was actually weapons of mass destruction and eliminating the weapons of mass destruction from this regime and eliminating this regime. Conveniently, in the week or two that we were in there, it became very strongly a message of freeing the Iraqi people. That should have been the message early on, in fact, in the six to eight months preceding this campaign, if we were trying to win over the hearts of the Arab world. Uh, that is a very difficult endeavor. And from my travels through the Arab world, we're not doing a very good job of it. Um, what you read in the newspapers and what you see on cable news and what you see on the broadcast news networks is nothing like they see over there, especially in a place like Iraq, where all they have access to is a newspaper called Babel, if you can believe it. It's really called Babel. And it was owned by, uh, well, owned and operated by Uday, who you know now is the crazier of Saddam's sons. And this is the kind of material that they are, you know, they have access to, and it paints us as the great Satan regularly, or at least it used to. I'm sure it's not in production right now. And it's not unlike many of the other newspapers in the Arab world either. You can't blame these poor sots for not liking us. All they know is that we're crusaders. All they know is that we're imperialist. All they know is that we want their oil. They don't know otherwise. And I'll tell you, a lot of the people I spoke with in Afghanistan had never heard of the Twin Towers, and most of them couldn't recognize a picture of George Bush. So you're dealing with populations who don't know better and who are very suspect of to who these new liberators are, because every liberator before has just wreaked havoc upon their lives and their children and their worlds. So I wasn't the least bit surprised to see these marches and these pilgrimages in the last few days telling the Americans, Thanks for the freedom to march to Najaf and Karbala, but get out. You know, this wasn't that big of a surprise. I think it may be a surprise, though, to the Pentagon. I'm not so sure that they, uh, that they were ready to deal with this many dissenters and this many um, supporters of an Islamic regime like next door in Iran. That will be, that will be a very interesting story to follow in the, in the coming weeks and months as to how this vacuum is filled and how we go about presenting a democracy to these people when if we give them democracy, they probably will ask us to get out, which is exactly what many of them want. 